everyone. Um, thank you for being here to celebrate the launch of Wild Wanderings by Bill Rubin, uh, published by Earth Press. Bill has been climbing mountains for over 70 years, um, from the highlands of Scotland to the peaks of Greenland. Um, as Chris Mornington said of this book, this hugely approachable and enjoyable book will be a most welcome addition to our bookshelves, and we do hope you feel the same. Okay, so introducing Phil and David to the stage. Thank you very much. Well, uh, when people come to uh, read the book, uh, they will discover a, a number of tales there from uh, of exploration in Ireland, uh, which clearly weren't done while you were in primary school. No, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so what was the, the group with which you became associated? I, I started uh, my engineering basically by uh, going to university and being associated with the start of the engineering club. And then later, uh, being in Belfast, a uh, northern section of the Irish Mountaineering Club was formed. And I was one of the founder members of that. And we were about 30 miles from the Morn Mountains. Uh, eventually, we had an old shack like cabin there called the Bloat House. Uh, it was named after Bloat, which was a device that a very impecunious uh, poet philosopher, Morris McMurray, I uh, used to concoct it. was a tin of spam, it was onions, uh, it was all cooked up with rice, but usually far too much was cooked. Uh, the result is, allegedly, that he used to take the remainder and put it in a drawer in the kitchen and go back to it the following week, but it was still impressively intact as far as he was concerned. So I started climbing there. I started, is this all right? Yes, yeah, sure. I started climbing with a guy called John White. Now, he was nicknamed Scout Troop. Why? Because he had the most huge pair of boots. It used to be tradition to wear big boots. And when we stayed in a youth hostel, the noise of him walking across the floor was like a Scout Troop creating. What did you do for gear in those days? Um, hard to say. Uh, they're all ex-war departments. Ice axes, if we had them, were wooden shafted. Um, they were very bad pitons. They were XWD carabiners that rusted if you didn't look after them. And uh, there must have been ropes. I eventually acquired a rope. And there was a Belfast rope works that made ropes and probably sold them legitimately and passing safety standards. But I got a rope uh, which was less than full weight, um, nylon, I've got terms, triple hazard or something, and it had eruptions all over it. The fabric fibers were bulging out of the parts of the rope. Now, it didn't really matter because you never fought, fell off anything. Part of the unwritten rule was you stay in the rock or you don't go up it. So it was really psychological protection to have a rope behind so you could say to your partner, uh, come up, I'm ready. Well, you might have been ready, but he didn't know whether you were or not. So. I didn't know that the rope was a factory reject. <laughs> I, I'll tell you, we tell, it's not in the book. All the chapters are tales in the book. T-A-L-E-S. Um, I went with this guy who was English, who was actually a member of a reputable Scottish club, and I also had a, a friend who came from Dublin, and he talks a different way, <coughs> and has different cultural, political, religious ideas. Anyway, um, three of us went to climb a thing called Dukesite Tower, which hadn't been climbed very often, and there's two other guys who were very good, and they went ahead. And we three lingered on, coming very slowly. Now, my accent was different from the Dublin accent. And this guy was so sensitive to picking up musical tones and everything that he started developing talking in a mixture of the two accents and brogues. <laughs> we got up the tower. We failed to go home that day. It was too late to do things. It took so long. We arrived home on a Monday, about the time most people were finishing work. 
and his wife wouldn't speak to him. She didn't know what had happened to him because he was talking to this one the Irish section this is quite impossible. <laughs> he was never allowed to go out with us again. <laughs> I mean, what's your favourite climbing area in Scotland, would you say? Um, I never had to ask that question and I would have to think about it. Um, any suggestions? <laughs> sky? I think sky is pretty good. That is really good. Yeah, I've done some interesting, nice things there. I don't like going out in the rain or the wet though. No. <laughs> so it's... I mean, in, in general, do you have any particularly favourite climb that you keep going back to? Or... You know, or you should know, that I strongly disapprove of repeating a climb that I've done. <coughs> uh, I've often been persuaded, well, I've been persuaded to go back and do the Great Prior, which is, uh, I was on, in Sky. Uh, but that was such an experience and so sticks in my mind that to repeat something is really eliminating the past. It never feels the same. You're not to the same people. It's the different conditions. Do something once and enjoy it to the full. I like writing things for, for my own enjoyment. I've been trying to write a bit about the time we went to climb the Matterhorn and didn't. And it mainly hinged on the fact that uh, there'd been a lot of snow and, and, and it was all falling off and we couldn't have done it anyway. But we engaged in the basement of the station hotel in a cigar smoking competition. We used to get very thin cigars about this length. And the idea of those who did smoke, most people did in those days, was to try and smoke this cigar without the ash falling off. <laughs> so you'd hardly breathe, you'd hardly move. The smoke curled up and everybody else got very bored. That's why we failed to try the matter on. <laughs> I really just wanted to say thank you, Phil, on behalf of generations of St. Andrew's students who have been their mountaineering mentor and continue to be their mountaineering mentor. Mm -hmm. um, many of us would not have had the careers we would have subsequently developed had we not been introduced to the Arctic, for example. Um, so you have uh, created quite a legacy. I won't say you left a legacy because you haven't gone yet. <laughs> and uh, a lot of it's captured in the book, which uh, as our uh, Reviewed, Chris Bonington has said it's a, a worthy addition to our bookshelves. Are there any things? Of course, I would say uh, all this going away to Greenland and all. It's been my pleasure, as you can imagine. Um, it's been enjoyable, it's been a worthwhile thing. A lot of things you do, if you do it are all are very, are very good like that. So, um, I should also point out that really, if you read this book, I have written it, but all the work from start to finish, even the idea of the book, was not mine. It's David Beldum's. He's been the editor, he's been the writer, he's been the this, that, and the other. So uh, I just uh, have complete. Um, I said, I've got nothing to do with this book. <laughs>